Preface to the New Translation of Night by Elie Wiesel If in my lifetime I was to write only one book, this would be the one. Just as the past lingers in the present, all my writings after night, including those that deal with biblical, Talmudic, or Hasidic themes, profoundly bear its stamp and cannot be understood if one has not read this very first of my works. Why did I write it? Did I write it so as not to go mad, or, on the contrary, to go mad, in order to understand the nature of madness, the immense, terrifying madness that had erupted in history and in the conscience of mankind? Was it to leave behind a legacy of words, of memories, to help prevent history from repeating itself? Or was it simply to preserve a record of the ordeal I endured as an adolescent, at an age when one's knowledge of death and evil should be limited to what one discovers in literature? There are those who tell me that I survived in order to write this text. I am not convinced. I don't know how I survived. I was weak, rather shy. I did nothing to save myself. A miracle? Certainly not. If heaven could or would perform a miracle for me, why not for others more deserving than myself? It was nothing more than chance. However, having survived, I need to give some meaning to my survival. Was it to protect the meaning that I set to paper an experience in which nothing made any sense? In retrospect, I must confess that I do not know, or no longer know, what I wanted to achieve with my words. I only know that without this testimony, my life as a writer, or my life, period, would not have become what it is, that of a witness who believes he has a moral obligation to try to prevent this enemy from enjoying one last victory by allowing his crimes to be erased from human memory. For today, thanks to recently discovered documents, the evidence shows that in the early days of their ascension to power, the Nazis in Germany set out to build a society in which there simply would be no room for Jews. Toward the end of their reign, their goal changed. They decided to leave behind a world in ruin, in which Jews would never seem to have existed. That is why everywhere in Russia, in the Ukraine, and in Lithuania, the Einstadtsgruppen carried out the final solution by turning their machine guns on more than a million Jews, men, women, and children, and throwing them into huge mass graves, dug just moments before by these victims themselves. Special units would then disinter the corpses and burn them. Thus, for the first time in history, Jews were not only killed twice, but denied burial in a cemetery. It is obvious that the war which Hitler and his accomplices waged was a war not only against Jewish men, women, and children, but also against Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, therefore Jewish memory. Convinced that this period in history would be judged one day, I knew that I must bear witness. I also knew that, while I had many things to say, I did not have the words to say them. Painfully aware of my limitations, I watched helplessly as language became an obstacle. It became clear that it would be necessary to invent a new language. But how was one to rehabilitate and transform words betrayed and perverted by the enemy? Hunger, thirst, fear, transport, selection, fire, chimney. These words all have intrinsic meaning. But in those times, they meant something else. Writing in my mother tongue, at that point close to extinction, I would pause at every sentence and start over and over again. I would conjure up other verbs, other images, other silent cries. It was still not right. But what exactly was it? It was something elusive, darkly shrouded for fear of being usurped, profaned. All the dictionary had to offer seemed meager, pale, lifeless. Was there a way to describe the last journey in sealed cattle cars? The last voyage toward the unknown? Or the discovery of a demented and glacial universe, where to be inhuman was human? where disciplined, educated men in uniform came to kill, and innocent children and weary old men came to die. Or the countless separations on a single fiery night, the tearing apart of entire families, entire communities, were, incredibly, the vanishing of a beautiful, well-behaved little Jewish girl with golden hair and a sad smile, murdered with her mother the very night of their arrival. How was one to speak of them without trembling and a heart broken for all eternity? Deep down, the witness knew then, as he does now, that his testimony would not be received. After all, it deals with an event that sprang from the darkest zone of man. Only those who experienced Auschwitz know what it was. Others will never know. But would they at least understand? 
Could men and women who consider it normal to assist the weak, to heal the sick, to protect small children, and to respect the wisdom of their elders, understand what happened there? Would they be able to comprehend how, within that cursed universe, the masters tortured the weak and massacred the children, the sick, and the old? And yet, having lived through this experience, one could not keep silent no matter how difficult, if not impossible, it was to speak. And so I persevered, and trusted the silence that envelops and transcends words, knowing all the while that any one of the fields of ashes in Birkenau carries more weight than all the testimonies about Birkenau. For, despite all my attempts to articulate the unspeakable, it is still not right. Is that why my manuscript, written in Yiddish, as And the World Remains Silent, and translated first into French, then into English, was rejected by every major publisher, French and American, despite the tireless efforts of the great Catholic French writer and Nobel laureate Francois Mariac? After months and months of personal visits, letters, and telephone calls, he finally succeeded in getting it into print. Though I made numerous cuts, the original Yiddish version still was long. Jerome Linden, the legendary head of the small but prestigious Editions de Minuet, edited and further cut the French version. I accepted his decision because I worried that some things might be superfluous. Substance alone mattered. I was more afraid of having said too much than too little. And now, scarcely ten years after Buchenwald, I realize that the world forgets quickly. Today, Germany is a sovereign state. The German army has been resuscitated. Use Koch, the notorious sadistic monster of Buchenwald, was allowed to have children and live happily ever after. War criminals stroll through the streets of Hamburg and Munich. The past seems to have been erased, relegated to oblivion. Today, there are anti-Semites in Germany, France, and even the United States who tell the world that the story of six million assassinated Jews is nothing but a hoax. And many people, not knowing any better, may well believe them, if not today, then tomorrow, or the day after. Before concluding this introduction, I believe it important to emphasize how strongly I feel that books, just like people, have a destiny. Some invite sorrow, others joy, some both. Earlier I described the difficulties encountered by Knight before its publication in French 47 years ago. Despite overwhelmingly favorable reviews, the book sold poorly. The subject was considered morbid and interested no one. If a rabbi happened to mention the book in his sermon, there were always people ready to complain that it was senseless to burden our children with the tragedies of the Jewish past. Since then, much has changed. Night has been received in ways I never expected. Today, students in high schools and colleges in the United States and elsewhere, elsewhere read it as part of their curriculum. How to explain this phenomenon? First of all, there's been a powerful change in the public's attitude. In the 50s and 60s, adults born before or during World War II showed a careless and patronizing indifference toward what is so inadequately called the Holocaust. That's no longer true. Back then, few publishers had the courage to publish books on that subject. Today, such works are on most book lists. The same is true in academia. Back then, few schools offered courses on the subject. Today, many do. And strangely, those courses are particularly popular. The topic of Auschwitz has become part of a mainstream culture. There are films, plays, novels, international conferences, exhibitions, annual ceremonies with the participation of the nation's officialdom. The most striking example is that of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. It has received more than 22 million visitors since its inauguration in 1993. This may be because the public knows that the number of survivors is shrinking daily and is fascinated by the idea of sharing memories that will soon be lost. For in the end, it is all about memory, its sources and its magnitude, and, of course, its consequences. For the survivor who chooses to testify, it is clear. His duty is to bear witness for the dead and for the living. He has no right to deprive future generations of a past that belongs to our collective memory. To forget would not only be dangerous but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Sometimes I am asked if I know the response to Auschwitz. I answer that not only do I not know it, but that I don't even know if a tragedy of this magnitude has a response. What I do know is that there is response in responsibility. When we speak of this era of evil and darkness, so close and yet so distant, 
Responsibility is the key word. The witness has forced himself to testify. For the youth of today, for the children who will be born tomorrow, he does not want his past to become their future. E.W.